still you want to have a small majority of interest rate. Uh, the collinear singularity in here is now cut off because the top fork has a mass, in fact, a big mass. So thetas want it to go down to something limited by just uh, the virtuality. But now, they effectively go down to something limited by m squared, the top fork mass. So the angle of emission does not want to be so awfully small. The theta squared is proportional to m squared. m squared over essentially 2t squared. So like if the top fork mass is 175, then Okay, so the angular distribution is a bit different. It's not, doesn't want to be so collinear. However, there's still gluon emissions, and the gluons still want to be soft. In fact. There's one more thing to recognize. Uh, the top fork is going to decay. Uh, and the time for it to decay is, uh, again, a physical time or virtuality time. So the virtuality in a gluon emission does not want to be less than n gamma. That is to say, the time it takes to emit that gluon does not want to be bigger than the time it takes for the top fork to decay, because the top fork is gone by then. So there's a limit on virtuality. And then, So what happens if you have charge and then goes out in a different direction all of a sudden? of that radiation is likely collinear to the B. It really likes to be collinear with the B. The B mass is only 5 dB. So that's not cutting off uh, the angle very much. So collinear with the B is highly favored. However, it's not so likely to be collinear with the top fork because uh, the angle is cut off by the top fork. So basically, gluons here either of those two is coming typically in a cone that goes from the B fork direction to the top fork direction. How narrow that cone is depends on how much transverse momentum the top fork has. If the top fork is highly boosted, that's a narrow cone. If the top fork is not so highly boosted, it's a kind of a wide cone. Okay, so that's what happened to our top fork. We made a W.
turbocharges accelerated and gluons are radiated. So you may think of this as having parton showers. By now, this is the third parton shower we have because we had a very hard event down here that made our top floor. That created a parton shower, and things got to be almost on that shell after a bit. But then the top part decayed and made another parton shower. Now we've got a third parton shower from the QQ bar that's the decay products of the top. And where's that radiation going to go? Uh, the Q and the Q bar like they like quarks, so the gluon radiation likes to be collinear with either one or the other of those, or it can be between those. And what have we got here? We have color zero coming in, or color singlet, and a quark and an antiquark that makes a dipole. So there's a color dipole stretched between the Q and the Q bar, and we want to have radiation in the angular region that are between those, or highly collinear to either the Q or the Q bar. So where does that radiation go? Likely between the Q and the Q bar, or collinear to one of those. Now I should mention one more thing that's not so often but for very, very soft emissions, virtuality is smaller than uh, the mass of the top four times the top four width, or the mass of the W times the W width. Those are emissions that happen on a very long time scale, longer than the time it took for the top of the W to decay. In that case, that emission color dipoles all over the place, it sees the whole event because you're emitting a gluon with a very, very long wavelength. They can look back and see the whole event, the, everything there. So again, you, you have emissions from every color charged particle, but you s switch around which of the color connected partners because we're seeing the whole event. Uh, on the other hand, that's such soft gluons that probably we're not able to adequately detect them in the atlas or CMS detectors, so it's maybe not so important. Okay, so since we know something about where the collinear and soft radiation goes in heavy particle decay, sequential heavy particle decays should have good signatures by looking for these structures that I've just been talking about. We do have a problem of contamination from initial state radiation that's always there, but that's just part of the structure. And having highly boosted heavy objects uh, helps with finding those things. So I come to the summary. To the model for the sequential heavy particle decays and knowledge of the structure of radiation and gauge theories, you can uh, help build filters that are going to tell, help to tell, that are help separate background events from signal events. And so I can mention now a little about how that works. Let me just go back to this picture. Well, there's many actually. Well, I forgot the one last. There. So here's a big fat jet that maybe came from, the, say it came from. What you do is you divide that into little teeny jets. Uh, I like to call them micro jets. So jets with a defined by KT algorithm with a R parameter of 0.2, which is pretty small. In fact, that corresponds more or less to the angular resolution of the atlas detector, or the atlas calendar. So divide your whole either a whole event or a whole uh, part of the event into these little subjects, I'll go through these lines represented here. And now that's the data that's going to go into a some kind of a mechanism for identifying top block decays or Higgs decays or whatever. And now the typical way 
So let us say, I think they use Cambridge Ockham. So we use the Cambridge Ockham jet finding algorithm to build the little jets into a big jet. And that jet finding algorithm gives you not only what's the big jet, we already knew that, but it gives you a sequential combination of first uh, subjects 1 and 12 <coughs> combined, and then subjects 2 and 4 combined, etc. So you get a little picture of what looks like a possible Barnard shell. And then you look inside of that and try to do two things. Try to look for mass drop condition. So two subjects of small mass combine into a bigger jet of much bigger mass. That's a clue that the big thing, you're seeing the decay right there. And at the same time as you're doing that, you're trying to throw away those uh, initial state radiation that you didn't want, that is not really part of the, say, top four example. So trying to throw away initial condition, initial state radiation means you're looking for wide angle soft little jets. Maybe these green ones here, those are wide angle and soft. When you, whenever your jet algorithm is trying to combine one of those with the main jet you're looking at, if it's too soft, you throw it away. That's called trimming or filtering. And you just get rid of them and work with the other jets and look for mass drop conditions on the other jet. Okay, so there's a number of methods that work like that. And uh, they do pretty well and the experimental groups are trying to learn how to use them better. So with that, I think I'll close and I'm happy to any additional questions. Sure. Common unboosted 
top floor. Yes. So what I sort of described is the structure of the top floor chip. Mm -hmm. If you now want to look for some new physics, say a new D boson that decays to a top and an anti top, this would be a great way to do it. Because it's one of these ways. Uh, so you have a what's called a top tagger to find a top floor chip going this way. And you so what do you do? First find jet going this way with lots of transverse momentum. Now a jet going the other way with lots of transverse momentum. You see whether this jet looked like a top floor. You see whether that jet looked like a top floor. And there's lots of handles, right? You've got the W mass, the top mass. It's pretty good on that. So if you find both jets look like top floors, then you take that subset of events and make a plot of the mass of the top pair, and you should have a bump equal to the G prime of the mass. Mm -hmm. So that that's the way to do it. I believe people have done something like that, mm -hmm. and they've so far not found this mm -hmm. But we're still hopeful. Just another question. Suppose G prime takes you to GD bar. Can you estimate what MT over MD is for the top to be? Uh, if the top has a transverse momentum of 500 GB or so, then you could consider it to be higher than a boost. Suppose I say I have a G prime is uh, 1 GB. Good, then the top works would have a transverse momentum of 500 GB. It's perfect for you. If it's central rigidity. Okay, so less than that, then it's unlikely it will be. Well, then I wouldn't call it high boosted, but that doesn't mean you can't use these same methods. It means that the top four, all the decay products in the top four uh, don't form a recognizable jet. And your analysis then has some more combinatorics in it because the top four decay products are like all over the detector and you have to pick them out. So it's a function of the machine energy plus MG prime and the is it fair to say? I don't think we need the machine energy. It's just uh, the mass of the Z prime and the mass of the top. Okay. So it doesn't matter if the Z prime is almost at rest or it's moving? I don't think that matters. If it's moving really fast, then uh, everything's going forward in the detector. It might be a bit harder. Certainly the calorimetry in the forward region is not so good. Thank you. So 10% uh, is a good rule of thumb? 10% was is the MT over MT prime. I think it doesn't need to be quite that 20% would be good enough. Okay. I mean, that's just, all I'm talking about is having an angle that's uh, not bigger than one. Thank you. One radian? One radian.
I will talk after this title. Uh, the content is a family. I presume not many audiences are familiar with the single spinner symmetry, so I prepare some uh, general remarks about single spinner symmetry. In the second part, uh, I will present our analysis of the <coughs> single spinner symmetry a trick uh, based on the quark gluon correlation functions. In the third part, I will discuss the impact of the twist three query gluonic correlation function of the single spinner symmetry. famous example of the single spinner symmetry is the, the asymmetry for the inclusive ion production uh, in the collision between the transversely polarized proton versus unpolarized proton. Okay. Uh, you can also produce ion with uh, the spin flipped, spin of the proton flipped. And the A sub M for single spinner symmetry is defined at this the Ferenberg E704 experiment uh, reported that as large as 30% uh, asymmetry, plus 30% asymmetry for pi plus, and uh, minus 30% asymmetry for the pi minus in the four directions. By the way, uh, I use pi uh, minus xf. Uh, I define the pi minus xf positive uh, if pi minus is produced in the forward direction of the transversely polarized problem. Okay, this is the experiment done at the center mass energy of 20 G. The later Greek did the same similar experiment, and they also reported uh, this is the result for the pi naught, uh, the large asymmetry in the forward direction of the polarized proton. In the backward direction, the asymmetry is al almost zero. This kind of largest single string asymmetry was very surprising because the conventional perturbative QCD in the twist to 2 level predicts almost zero asymmetry. Uh, it should be like this if the twist to mechanism works. Uh, this is because uh, transverse spin asymmetry means uh, there is a helicity flip, single helicity flip is necessary. Therefore, uh, in QCD, the helicity flip can be provided only as a small quark mass effect in the hard cross sections. And also, the single spin asymmetry is a naively T auto observable, which means it changes sign if, the, if we change the direction of the time, but without interchange of initial and final state. That kind of effect is possible in the time reverse invariant the theory like QCD, but the, it occurs as an interference between the amplitudes which have different complex phases. In order to have such complex spaces, uh, we loop integral. Therefore, uh, extra alpha s appears here. Since the code mass is here, uh, we need to compensate <coughs> uh, by momentum to make this asymmetry dimension less. Therefore, uh, the asymmetry is so tiny. Therefore, in order to accommodate such large singular symmetry, we need to extend the framework for QCD hard processes. And lots of efforts have been done to understand this uh, strange single spin asymmetry, and the mechanism for single spin asymmetry have been understood in some detail by now. And uh, those mechanisms uh, are very often classified into two categories depending on the kinematic regions they cover. The first one is the so-called naively t the distribution for fragmentation functions, such as Sievers and Collins functions, right? And those, in this mechanism, it describes the single spin asymmetry in the region of this small transverse momentum region in the framework of the TMD activation. Well, TMD means transverse momentum dependent. Or it's sometimes called KD factorization. By introducing the intrinsic transverse momentum in Pion, uh, we can define extra distribution and fragmentation functions. However, uh, the, these t odd distribution or fragmentation functions are generally process dependent. The another mechanism is the multi part correlation functions, such as the quark gluon or purely gluonic correlation functions. 
and it describes the single spin asymmetry in the region of the last transverse momentum as a twistedly observable in the collinear factorization, uh, which uh, Professor Sober explained in his lectures. And the, since these the correlation functions appearing here are the light form correlation function, they are not, they are the process independent. Okay? Therefore, if one determines the complete set of correlation functions in some processes, it can be used to predict uh, for other processes. <coughs> Could you explain why is TMD distribution as a process dependent? Could you please explain why this TMD distribution are process dependent in this course? Sorry, could, could you repeat again? Explain why TMD distributions or TMD PDFs are process dependent because this is... Okay, uh, because uh, the quark fields are uh, separated in the transport direction and the gauge link which restores gauge invariance is necessary and uh, we cannot completely throw it away, even in light form gates. And uh, there's, for example, Sibel's function in series changes sign uh, in the Durian Durian process. Yeah, that's exactly right. Sorry? Left jump can be Yeah, for hadron hadron production, uh, the gauge link becomes more and more complicated, and uh, that becomes uncontrollable. <coughs> okay, let's proceed to the next. And there are some studies, re uh, several uh, re relations between these two approaches have been known. The for processes such as Dorelia and the series, of which both uh, TMD factorization uh, works, and in the intermediate region of the transverse momentum, these two frameworks are shown to give the equivalent single spin asymmetry. It, it's been shown by these, by these papers. Therefore, for some processes, these two frameworks, they look completely different, but they give equivalent single spin asymmetry. Therefore, they are kind of a uh, unique description of the QCD. Uh, in single spin asymmetry in QCD. In the remainder of this talk, I will focus on the second approach. In order to give you a rough idea how the twist free contribution arises, uh, I wrote these diagrams. Let's consider the hadron production, inclusive hadron production in PP collisions. Various amplitude contributes, the proton uh, colliding with the transversely polarized proton, uh, patterns are coming in and uh, experience hard scattering and one pattern produce final pattern, fragmenting to find the pattern. Uh, one quark is coming in in this diagram and the quark and the gluon pair are coming in and the gluon is coming in and the two gluons are coming in. The cross section uh, is uh,